So long ago, way before the age of the Erd Tree and all that fancy pants golden shit, the giants lived in mountaintops alongside their lesser known kin, the trolls, and a race of northern humans that were said to be the descendants of giants. Their neighbors, on the other hand, were the astrologers, the original creators of stuff like the bird's eye telescopes that we see across the map, or the one we can carry on us that looks like a little piece broken off from it. They probably resided in places like the Stargazer's ruins or the more recently lived in Heretical Rise, which could have been where Randy's mentor lived at some point, maybe later relocating to Chelona's Rise on that Moonlight Altar Peninsula area, but that's just speculation. But these ancient astrologers all love the stars, and one day one of them saw a star fall in the sky through his little telescope, and it became real, and the amber of the cosmos rained down, and that amber itself became glenstones which would indeed become an integral part of uh, sorcery itself. Now these astrologers would eventually build an academy and discover ways to extend their lives, such as how they use uh, primal glenstones to switch bodies. They cut out their heart with a primal glenstone dagger, and they essentially die and become undead, according to the description. That's how I got it, at least. But they cut out their heart with the dagger, and they replace it with a primal glenstone. And then they use that gl primal glenstone to switch bodies with uh, other bodies thus potentially living forever. Shit was absolutely nuts in those days, but it was purely scientific. So naturally, someone needed to bring order to all of this ambitious chaos that was going on. A young astrologer would discover a bewitching full moon. Maybe one of the twin moons that's always mentioned in the Nox descriptions, namely the uh, moon of Nox Stella Charm that mentions a black moon, but it also mentions two twin moons. Anyway, Rinaldo discovered one or both of these and seemingly befriended him. While all of her contemporaries were focused on the primeval current and its many mysteries and powers, as well as just pushing the limits of glenstone sorcery and mortality itself, it was essentially a lawless wasteland of scientific discovery. She used the bewitching moon to pretty much charm the nips off of all the academy and rise to the top. She would eventually become governor and then found her own royal house called Caria and become the first queen of Caria. And I think the only queen because there's no other mentions of any other queens of Caria at least. And by the time of the game, she's still technically queen. So it seems to be that she's the first and last queen of Caria. Now sometime after Renala established her house and pretty much had control of all of Lyurnia, the Golden Army of Landell came knocking. At the head of this army was a science project of Queen Merica's known as Radagon of the Golden Order, a red-haired champion of the Erd Tree who has uh, some renown and I guess fighting in the War of the Giants supposedly. But Radagon and his armies did not know defeat. I mean, we've heard that before. Look at Melania. How true was that? But anyway, but no matter what they did, they couldn't break the combined strength of both the Academy and the Carrion royal family. So in an act of sheer George Martinian writing, they would fall in love. Radagon and Rinala, they would literally fall in love. Radagon would re repent his territorial advances at the Chapel of Vows, cleanse himself in the Celestial Dew that was actually also known as a Night Tear, and it's originally a Nox ritual. I mean, look at the uh, statue. That's clearly a Nox. But these two would marry and have three children together. Rani, Rikard, and Radon. Now during this time, Rinala and Radagon governed the lands of Lyrnia together, and Radagon would make several changes to things that were originally carrion tradition, such as ordering the preceptors to wear these masks, but he also spent a good amount of time studying the sorcery at the academy. He would likely apply some of his knowledge that he learned at the academy to creating his own incantations further down the road as they require a bit of intelligence as well as faith. He also had an abnormally large direwolf as a pet that he taught carrying glint blade sorceries to. It's actually really cool. Sort of like Sif 2 or Sorcerer Sif. I found the one near Carrion Manor before I fought the one at the Academy, and I thought visually it was one of the coolest things I'd seen in the game so far. But yeah, his big red wolf appears to uh, have had offspring because there's one at Carrion Manor, one at the Academy, one in Nakron, and one at the Consecrated Snowfield, I believe. The ones outside the boss fight are obviously a little bit smaller than the one in the boss fight, I believe. I thought it was interesting, though, that these wolves have kind of strayed from their home, similar to how Radagon and Rinala's own children have. I mean, one ended up in Nakron, that's similar to, like, Rani's aspirations. One ended up in the snowfield, I guess that's similar to, uh... Perhaps it's trying to get revenge for what happened to Radon, maybe it's hunting Melania. Obviously extremely far-fetched, but you never know. And then there's, of course, the one that hangs around the manor. I guess that's more similar to Rani. 
But I just thought it was interesting how maybe there's more than three, but I only found three of the smaller red wolves. I thought it was possible that maybe they were the, uh, obviously the pups of Radagon's big wolf, but also the childhood pets of Radagon and Renala's children. Like, obviously, presently, they're not their pets anymore, but maybe they were at some point before they wandered off. And at some point, either Renala or Radagon or both of them unanimously would agree to ban the use of the primeval sorcery at the Academy. Now, primeval sorcery or the primeval current is the original source of Glintstone sorcery, but it was also extremely dangerous if used improperly. So when they banned the use of the current, they also hounded the famous Archmagisters Lusat and Azur from the school. One hides at Malgilmir in the Hermit Village with a group of his disciples that presumably followed him from the Academy, teaching sorcery to the demi-humans that had taken over the village after slaughtering the original inhabitants, which appeared to be those celebrants that we see at the Windmill Village. And the other one is imprisoned at a hideaway near his original home of Celia, the town of sorcery. Now one of their students, a particular prodigy named Selen, would be enraged by their ousting and would begin acting out and creating seeds of stars, a forbidden act that has something to do with the primal current and involves turning whole groups of sorcerers into a single ball of stone heads that is essentially like a moving conglomerate of, I guess, their souls? But it appears that these souls are in some kind of agonizing pain while trapped inside there as evidenced by the ending of Selen's quest. Or maybe she's just currently fighting for dominance inside that stone ball. But anyway, this was of course a forbidden act at the academy, and she was not only expelled but hunted by one of the premier hunters and servants of the royal family, or friends I guess I should say of the royal family, slave knight Gale cosplayer witch hunter Jaren. She escaped with the help of a carrion preceptor by the name of Celibus, who likely crafted a body to prove as some kind of a dummy, or possible like a decoy body for her. It's tough to say. I don't know how exactly he helped her, but both of them kind of acknowledge it. Although Selen kind of remembers Celibus as, you know, in an unsavory type of way, as most people do. And most people should. But I think it's entirely likely that Jaren kept hunting her at least until the Shattering rolled around and he was honor-bound by Radon to go serve as his battle commander. But everything would pretty much be all well and good for an undisclosed amount of time until, uh... Well, until Elden Lord... Godfrey was hounded from his lands alongside his tarnished armies. Everything changed when the tarnished were exiled. Hold on real quick. So anyways, after Godfrey and, uh, his, all of his tarnish had their grace robbed from them by Merica and were banished. She would also recall her other half, Radagon. Radagon, for his part, would leave Renala, but he wouldn't leave her without a gift. He gave her this uh, amber egg of rebirth, which is actually, I believe, some kind of a great ruin of some kind. But he would then go off to, uh, well, to go be Queen Merica's second consort, despite being possibly just some kind of alchemy experiment. Radagon would also change the uh, Moonlight Greatsword that Renala had forged for him, which was basically a custom when it came to the House of Caria, is that the, uh, the women of Caria would forge a Moonlight Greatsword for their new husband or their prospective husband. I mean, Rani does it for the player character in the game if you decide to go through her questline. Except, of course, it's a Dark Moon Greatsword since she kind of represents the Dark Moon while her mother represents the Full Moon. I'd like to believe that... This uh, Golden Order Greatsword was once just a full moon Greatsword. But it's kind of fucked up. It's like he tried to cover it up, making it look like the Elden Ring, but it still originally, you know, there's telltale signs that it was originally something made by the Queen of Caria. So maybe he disguised it so he could still keep it around and justify having it around so he could use it, you know, to remember her by. But I think it's kind of like, uh, like his many Golden Order fundamentalist incantations that he's created, they all require int. So that kind of tells me that he sort of took all of the knowledge he learned living amongst the nobility of Caria and, you know, going to the academy. And then just applied it to uh, all of his stuff that he knew about the greater will and the incantations and all that. Creating, of course, these uh, sort of hybrid spell incantation kind of things. 
Well, it looks like King Morgoth wasn't the only one who kind of got used and abused by the uh, Golden Order, you know, just to further and protect itself. I guess, obviously, in a different way. But they sort of just sent Radagon over there, you know, to absorb a lot of the knowledge and all the secrets of Caria and fucking the Academy, and then he just went and took it back to the Golden Order and, you know, created all these new golden incantations. It's pretty fucked up. I guess it could also be seen as, um... A sign that the vow or whatever like Muriel talks about you know they're not so easily broken like it was hard for him to shake all that stuff that he learned at the Academy and that it wound up in all of the incantations he created just because you know that's just the way he saw things now I don't know it's tough to say Radagon is one of the more mysterious characters of the game I feel like but anyway when Radagon did this, when he ditched Rinala from America, it would basically elevate all of Rinala's children to demigod stepchildren status, essentially demigod status. Rani herself, Rinala's favorite daughter, being an Empyrean, who was also to receive like a wolfish stepbrother from the Two Fingers, which is of course also seen in Merica herself, who has a wolfish stepbrother named Malekith. Meanwhile, her uh, other son, Radon, would become a famous champion and sort of a fanboy of Godfrey, adopting his uh, lion motif. He basically saw like a kindred spirit in Godfrey because he was this sort of great warrior, and he aspired to be just like the Elden Lord. And of course, the black sheep of the family, Rykard, would travel the worlds outside the lands between for some time before returning home with a dancer named Tanith to settle at Mount Gilmir. Deep in the mountain, he would discover an ancient serpent cult and also these old magma hexes that he would turn into uh, functional sorceries. Or I guess I should say modern sorceries. Now, Rinala herself would be heartbroken by what Radagon did, his sudden departure and then just leaving her with an egg and then dipping off to go be with Merica, the goddess, and having two new kids with his new wife. But she didn't take this shit lying down like some kind of bitch. She sought revenge. I think it was at this point that Rinala would introduce her daughter Rani to the Dark Moon, who I think manifested itself as the Snowy Crone in a manner not unlike Shabriri or Gowri or other servants or avatars of Outer Gods. Now I'm not saying the moons are some kind of Outer God, but I'm not saying that they're not, or that they're not powerful enough to manifest some kind of an avatar to do their bidding for them. But anyway, Rani, being an Empyrean, could potentially succeed Merica. Rinala would seemingly leave Rani in the crone's care to carry out the eventual downfall of the Golden Order and bring about the Age of the Night. The full moon and the dark moon could of course be the twin moons of the Nox people that are mentioned in the Black Moon of Noxtella's description. I believe that Rinala herself, whether, you know, whether knowingly or not, sort of harbored these two moons after they escaped the destruction of whatever city was destroyed by Astel and the Nox were forced to flee and were buried underground basically to hide and live under a false night sky and all that. But there was specifically a black moon of Noxtella that was said to have been a guide to countless stars which is uh, which to me similarly correlates to Rani's ending, the Age of Stars. So I think that when Rinala left Rani in the care of the Snowy Crone it was so that in the long run Rani would get some kind of a revenge. Not just for Rinala herself but for the, uh, the Nox. I also think that Rinala herself had no, you know, designs to have her daughter be used as a tool of revenge for the Nox until what was done to her by Radagon. And I think Rani, you know, went along with it willingly because she wanted to learn more. She seems like someone who wanted to learn more and was, you know, at this point in the game when we meet her is acting on her own agency. But I think it's likely that her motives behind, you know, her goals in the game are at least partly influenced by how the Golden Order did her mom and her teachings from the Snowy Crone, you know. But after leaving Rani in the care of her new mentor, Rinala would then devote her time to basically practicing the grim art of rebirth with that golden eggs. I think at least the original purpose of her whole creating, you know, the Sweetings had to have been, you know, creating bodies for these sorcerers to then use as new bodies, basically. I mean, I can't think of another purpose that they would have. But they're all born imperfect and their memory fades more with each rebirth. Anyway though, Rinala's sanity would begin treading thin ice during this time and it wouldn't really completely bottom out until the famous Night of Black Knives. 
in which one of Renala's own children will be one of the first casualties. Her favored daughter Rani, although in actuality the Lunar Princess had perished in body only while her spirit would eventually inhabit a peculiar doll resembling her mentor, the Snowy Crone. Now this Knight of Black Knives would also result in Merica essentially shattering the Elden Ring and causing the shattering. The Academy had also had enough of Renala by this time and likely predicted that the uh, loss of a daughter would send their governor further down the rabbit hole of madness and also just beginning to see cracks in the Carrion royal family seeing a weakness that they could exploit you know that they could finally exploit the demigods were probably like you know Renala's WMD her insurance and now you know she didn't have that she didn't have a deterrent against mutiny because her other two kids were kind of off doing their own thing I mean Radon a famous horse and mineral enthusiast would elect to participate in the shattering challenging the capital only to be beaten back by the veiled monarch Godfrey's own son Morgot who had taken it upon himself to defend the capital Radon would eventually lose his sanity in a fight against the amputee Valkyrie while Renala's other son Rykard would refuse to participate in the shattering and instead chose to wage a war against the Erd Tree and the Golden Order itself he basically invited heroes far and wide to join him in this act of blasphemy going against the Erd Tree, and it was his dream to see the Erd Tree burn, something that, you know, would eventually come true in the events of the game. But somewhere down the road, he would allow himself to be consumed by the ancient snake god of the volcano and would merge with the giant serpent, essentially severing himself from the greater will in a manner not unlike his sister, who he assisted in her plot during the Night of Black Knives and the theft of the Rune of Death itself, as she awarded him with a relic that would allow him to fight Malekith if he needed to. Basically, if Malekith came seeking revenge against, you know, his uh, Rune of Death being stolen. But with her kids in disarray and the Academy attempting to mutiny against her, some, like Selen, were tired of living under the order of uh, the Carrions for so long and resented the Queen for banning the use of the Primeval Current. While others like the Lazuli saw the moon and stars as equal, which itself was considered heresy, the queen's sanity appeared to finally have been broken. So the Carrion royal family and its loyalists were forced to act without their leader, and would have to scramble to defend their holdings, and despite being severely outnumbered, they appear to have come out on top, in at least more than a few of these battles. Obviously the King's Road ruins were sacked by the Cuckoo Knights, but they were immediately obliterated by the, uh, countermeasures in place at Carrion Manor on that road. Part of the reason that the Carrion forces prevailed in a lot of these battles was, aside from strategic advances, the whole quantity versus quality argument. The Carrion's enchanted knights themselves were said to be at least worth 20 men individually, and were masters of combat and sorcery, and when the Lucarian Cuckoo soldiers saw these guys, they pretty much shit a brick and ran. I mean, it's like the old Battlefront game when you see a hero running towards you. The Carrions also had enchanted troll knights. And if the regular enchanted knight was worth 20 cuckoo soldiers, then these troll variants were worth at least 50. These trolls were treated as equals to their human counterparts in Caria, and basically nowhere else in the lands between. Which I think says something about Caria being at least a more accepting place, or at least being strategic about befriending the trolls and treating them as equals, so that way that these trolls probably fight twice as hard as the ones that fight for the Golden Order. I mean, treating them with kindness while still having ulterior motives is still, you know, treating them better than enslaving them. But I do think that them being treated as equals genuinely strengthened their fighting resolve when it came to fighting for their queen, who they all swore an individual oath to every single troll knight. The Carrions also had the immensely powerful preceptors who are all extremely, extremely skilled sorcerers as we see when we fight Sorcerer Miriam and you know we don't really see Celibus do anything cool besides make puppets but still. I think Miriam was there to show us that these preceptors were very powerful magic users. Anyway, the preceptors are often accompanied by their albinoric apprentices who would make puppets out of the fallen cuckoo soldiers to further supplement their numbers, which more than leveled the playing field against the forces of Rey Lucaria, whose forces mainly consisted of foot soldiers and regular soldiers and knights backed by marionettes. I believe the bulk of these uh, forces were conscripted from the nearby surrounding areas of the academy in Lyrnia 
While specifically the Cuckoo Knights refused to be just the mere servants of the academy and instead were paid in sorceries, mostly entry level ones, but they likely wanted to learn these so that they can combat the enchanted knights that were fighting for the Carrions. And like many of the other remaining armies in the lands between, you can also find pumpkin heads that are loyal to the uh, Rey Lucarians. Now the Academy would even try to level Rinala's family home. They sent a band of Cuckoo Knights to first sack the King's Realm ruins before continuing up the road towards the manor, only to be obliterated by the magical artillery that's still in place by the events of the game. Overall, unless I miss something, it's kind of tough to say which side really came out on top through all of this. I mean, there's some evidence here and there. It's also possible that the conflict is still ongoing. I mean, Renala is still in prison, technically. But she's also guarded, seemingly, by a named Carrion Enchanted Knight, who it's possible he could be a defector and he's siding with the Academy against Renala. That's entirely possible, but... Or perhaps he's trying to infiltrate the Academy, hoping to free Renala. Or the other alternative is that the Carrions came out on top and uh, the forces of Cuckoo are now loyal to Renala and the Academy is now loyal to Renala. I guess that's also a possibility. I like to think that the conflict is still ongoing or that the Carrions won personally. But it's just as likely that the uh, Academy could have come out on top. Now that's more or less where her story leaves off until we encounter her at the Academy in her boss room and we open those big doors. Once we step into her arena, we realize she's protected by her rebirth scholars she calls Sweetings that uniquely have a golden eye and a blue eye, which kind of mirror the union of silver and gold that Renala and Radagon once represented, a very deep bond that was broken and, as Muriel puts it, was bound to have some consequences. Now, during the second phase of her fight, her daughter Rani shows up and conjures up a projection of Renala in her prime, fully equipped with Azur's Comment, the Full Moon, and numerous spirit summons, including a fucking spirit summon troll. In this instance, we get a brief glimpse into the power and ferocity she once commanded, before having her mental fortitude completely destroyed by a series of extremely unfortunate events that all started with Radagon's sudden departure and culminated with the death of her beloved daughter, who she had thought would bring about the Age of Night and avenge her. Although I think her treatment at the hands of the Golden Order, the Greater Will, and Radagon left a lasting impact on her kids. At least particularly on Rykard and Rani. Now the Praetor, for all the horrors he may have committed and all the atrocities you know, he might have been party to, at least some of the sentiment he had for the Golden Order likely stemmed from how his father and the Greater Will used his mother. You know, even creating whole schools of incantations based off of, you know, ripped off of the knowledge he learned at the Academy and from Lyrnia and applying it to the Golden Order. Rykard, you know, why was what Rykard did blasphemous? He was opposing, he was exacting justice, I like to think, on the Golden Order for what they did to his mom. I also think Radon might have disliked Radagon in some way for what he did to his mom. I mean, already... Radon seems to have not had a great relationship with Radagon. I mean, he idolized Godfrey and adopted this whole lion motif in honor of Godfrey. You know, not his dad, but someone else's dad. Which, I don't know, kind of weird, bro. Seems like there might be a little more to that story. And of course there's Rani, who, if her ending is followed, is basically her mother's final fuck you to Radagon and the Greater Will. Based on, uh her final words in her boss fight which since the final words are when it's a shade of Renala could just be a memory that was imparted to Rani from her mother maybe when her mother left her with the crone maybe that's evidence of uh, the final words she imparted to her before you know she never saw her again because of what happened her supposed death and all that or it could be Renala coming back to some kind of coherent form and realizing her daughter's alive and still trying to carry out the plan which in my opinion is the more hopeful out of the two possibilities. But the final words specifically are weave the night into being and I think that almost confirms that uh, what Renala was doing by entrusting Rani to the snowy crone was bringing in the Nox Age of Night which was likely motivated by her treatment at the hands of Radagon. She probably felt herself slipping away and that's why she entrusted Rani to the whole snowy crone and the whole thing in the first place. It's also possible that she was playing the part of this heartbroken, you know, loopy, crazy old lady just to divert attention from her. I think that's also a possibility too. But 
I've kind of rambled on long enough. I mean, I didn't think much of Renala when I first fought her and, you know, learned she's just Randy's mom and all that. But like most things in these games, when you actually look into them, they're actually a lot more interesting than you might have thought. I mean, she seems like a character straight out of, like, the histories George Martin writes about in um, A Song of Ice and Fire. Except, obviously, with a much more heavy fantasy uh, sort of theme. But anyway, let me know if I got anything wrong or if I messed up the timeline in any ways or if I got events mixed around and all that because I think I got it pretty uh, spot on, but I could be wrong. So this was all one big plot to weaken the whole nation of Caria and Lyrnia as a whole as the Golden Armies couldn't defeat it in combat or through warfare and by doing it this way they managed to get all of Caria and the Academy's secrets and run off with them and create whole new schools of incantations based around them. They basically sent Radagon over there and he bled them for all they had. And when he ran off it sent the whole area into chaos and civil war. Basically it let the whole region cannibalize itself. But anyway, I hope you guys found it informative in some way. If you liked it, please like it. If you disliked it, please dislike it. If there's anything you wanted to add or point out, please uh, comment. I always like discussing stuff in the comments. And uh, my next video will likely be about why Radon held the stars back because I came up with some ideas while I was making this one and it seems like a fun little rant video to do before I, before I get back to work on the uh, death and mausoleum one. But anyway, you guys have a good one. I'll see you next time. Uh, let's take a, a closing hit, shall we? See, this is why Rykard's great. I too like to see trees burn. Alright, everybody have a good one. You wish to know more of Lady Renala. She is queen, head of the Carian royal family, and governor of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, the great and beautiful full moon witch. Sadly, her heart was broken when Lord Radigan left her. And then, when the Academy rebelled against the royals, she was locked away in the Grand Library. In the end, Lady Renala was left alone, cradling the amber egg Lord Radigan bequeathed her. Now she devotes herself to it through forbidden rite, the grim art of reincarnation. You would do well to remember, severing a vow, strongest of bonds, has consequences ever more dire.